Let us pray. The Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this morning. We thank you for allowing us to be able to gather here safely in person and in our homes virtually, dear Lord. We thank you for this special time, dear Lord, in which we've gathered to join in worship together. Dear Lord, we ask that you bless what takes place here today, that it brings us renewal, dear Lord, that it gives us new strength, dear Lord, to continue out and carry out your will. These things we pray in your son's name. Amen. Good morning, Metropolitan. Let us stand as we affirm our faith found in your bulletin. In unison, I believe in God, the maker of heaven and earth, the ruler and preserver of my life. I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, my Lord and Savior. I believe in the Holy Ghost, which proceeds from the Father and the Son, who is the giver of life. I believe in the Holy Bible, the universal church, holy baptism, and the Lord's Supper. I believe in myself as a child of God. I believe that God is to be honored by the first fruits of my time, talents, and substance. Therefore, I commit unto him for the work of the church, my life, my tithes, and my offerings. I believe in the resurrection of the dead and life in the world to come. Amen. You may be seated.
Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is indeed a privilege to have the opportunity to recognize those who are visiting with us this morning in the sanctuary, as well as those who are visiting with us on our virtual platform. If we have, first, I would like to recognize the visitors that are here in our service this morning. If you don't mind, will you please stand, recognize, and introduce yourself and any words or comments that you may have? Thank you. Glad to have you in our service. At this time, I also like to recognize those who are on our virtual platform, although they may not be able to see you. But we want to say this morning, we're glad to have you on our virtual platform. And Brother Leonard, we're glad to have you in our service. For any reason that you do not have a church, those who's on our virtual platform, or that your church, the doors are closed at this time. Our Metropolitan Church is open on the virtual platform as well here in the present. We just thank you for being with us today and pray that today that you will be uplifted by the music that you may hear, continue to hear, and the word from our executive pastor, Reverend Barnett. We just so thankful for all that you've done by coming this morning because in the Shelby County area, there's many churches that you could have attended on the virtual platform as well here in present. And we thank you. And we hope as you continue to be with us today that you leave here and be safe and have a blessed day. Now I come before you again. Good morning to those who just maybe just clicked on, on our virtual platform. It gives me great privilege to pray this morning because of everything going on in our life, we all need prayer. And sometimes we do not understand what prayer can do. Prayer can bring about change. At this time, I would like to pray. My Father, God in heaven, thank you this morning for allowing us to be here. Father, I know I can start off praying to you, asking you for a lot of blessings and asking you for a lot of changes. But first of all, Father, we all should be thankful to ask thank you for the things that you are doing for us. To wake up us, wake us up this morning, Father, to put clothes on us, Father, and those who was able to even have a meal this morning. We have so many of our fathers that we may not be able to do the things that we can do for ourselves, but we thank you for allowing us to have caregivers line up have those in the medical facilities to take care of us and do the things that we need. We should be so thankful because you're giving us transportation to get to the points that we need to go to get things done. We so thank you for parents, grandparents, uncles and aunts, and those who are taking care of us as children. And we so thank you for our children that are continuing their lives on in the school system. At this time, we do pray for the children in our school system. We definitely indeed pray for their protection and safety. We pray that they continue to learn and understand, Father, that there is a Father that who care for them, that can do all for them, and will do all for them. And we're so thankful for all the things that you do. And we just ask you, Father, as we look around and we see things going on, Many of us, we don't know how to answer these things that are going on. We just ask questions all the time. Why, why, Father? But I can say this morning to our brothers and sisters that are on our platform and, and those who are here present, that we have a Father. If you only take your issues and problems to your Father, he can help you. What I believe, Father, that many of us believe in using GPS to take us from point A to point B. But you are my GPS because anytime that I'm in need of something and anytime I'm not sure, I know I can just call on you. And when I'm not sure if I'm going the right direction, you know 
that you would get me there in a safe and protected way. We so thank you for our, our pastor, and we just pray for our pastor and his family, and pray for our emergency pastor and his family as well, and all those who are in our sanctuary this morning, Father, because we do need prayer. We need more loving. We need more uplifting, and we need more protection. We're so thankful all. I'm also thankful this morning, Father, that my wife that is taking care of her mother. Sometime at night, Father, when I'm going to bed, I can hear my wife tell her mother, Mama, I love you. And that touches me, my father, because my mother is with you, left us on her 31 years ago. But it is great to have a mother that you can say, Mama, that you can touch and say, I love you. If there's anyone in this sanctuary or on this platform that have a mama, if you may not be able to touch her because she's in another location, pick up the phone sometime today and just call her and say, mama, I love you. Not only moms, your dad is as well. But we're so thankful for those things that you provided for us because many times that's all we need is someone to say we love you. And this morning, I take a special time this morning, Father, to recognize the great ushers we have. I'm so thankful, Father, when this position was asked to give, be given to me as a president of the usher board, no, I did not want to take it. It's because there were so many great ushers out there that are already doing the work. But I could not let Sister Hester Powell down because she is a person that I look up to and admire. And I'm so thankful because the day that we open our doors, the first Sunday in May, the ushers that have been coming for the those Sundays that they could have come, they're here. And my fellow sisters and brother ushers, I'm so thankful in my heart that you have been supported. You've been there for me. And you've been there with me. And thank you. And I also thank my young ushers. You're there on the fourth Sunday to give some of our sisters and brothers a break. Thank you for all that you do. And this morning, Father, I just say, I end this prayer again. Thank you because if not because of all the things that you've done, it's because that when we can do for ourselves, those are doors that you open, that you know what we need to go in. And there's all sorts of doors that you close because you know that it's not the place we need to do it. And I thank you for all these things because of your son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Thank you, thank you, amen.
It's good to know the Lord. And thanks to God, honor to you, Pastor Moore, Dr. Porter, and greetings to all you wonderful people here this morning. It is always a pleasure to have the task to stand before you and share God's word with you. Our text this morning, we'll be revisiting a text. Our text this morning comes from John, the 11th chapter verses 1 through 44, and don't worry, I won't read all 44 verses. John 11, 1 through 44. And I'm reading the NRSD version. Text states, now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister, Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Verse 17, when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and calling for you. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. Verse 39, Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth in his face wrapped in a cloth, Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Unbind him and let him go. Our thought for this morning is dead ends equal starting points. Dead ends equal starting points. For those of us who find ourselves familiar with death, whether it is the death of a wife, a husband, a child, a friend, a parent, a relative, a leader, or a neighbor, this biblical account of Lazarus being raised from the dead in John 11 is one that can bring forth mixed emotions. Where was this Jesus when my loved one died? A question that is natural for us to have when experiencing the loss of a loved one. Lord, they died on Monday. We had the funeral on Saturday. One, two, three, four days. Why didn't you wake them before the clock struck 11 a.m. that Saturday morning? The family marched into the sanctuary and their loved one laid there cold as ice. Why, Lord? Why? 
This text can cause us to cling more closely to our Christian faith that acknowledges that life exists beyond death. For those who believe in Christ, eternal life. It is also a text that can cause us to be a bit jealous and even bitter when we think about how the Lord blessed Mary and Martha in the midst of their grief for the loss of their brother. What the Lord did in this text was nothing short of miraculous and spectacular. It was amazing. Yet God didn't do it without reason. Jesus was laying the foundation of faith, not just for his disciples, Mary and Martha and the others who lived at the time of this great miracle. But Jesus was laying the foundation of faith for us who live today and read this witness account via the Gospel of John. It is important for us to know, church, that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, not just so we can hope and believe that he can raise our loved ones to live again in this life with us, but it is important for us to know that as believers that our God is more than capable of doing anything, period. Now, if we only look at today's text, and limit Jesus's ability to the resurrection of Lazarus. Back to life on this side of heaven, we look at the text with blinded eyes. It is not enough for us to have the text within our sight, but we must look at and examine the text with insight. When we examine this text with insight, we can grasp that Lazarus does more than merely represent Jesus's divine ability to raise the dead human being. But Lazarus represents death on a much larger scale and God's ability to call death back to life in various situations. There once was a girl named Katie. Katie was smart and had a God-given gift of understanding mathematics. Girls with and math during the era of Katie's youth was not seen as the most compatible parent, especially when it came to the world of using math beyond the classroom. Yet despite her being a woman, and not only that, but a woman of color, a black woman, her gift for understanding math took her far beyond the classroom. In those days, if you were black and educated and good enough to be good at complex math, you were bound to find yourself teaching school. However, Katie, who I'm sure would have been an excellent teacher or even an outstanding college or graduate school professor of mathematics, found herself working alongside other black math, other black women who were mathematicians in a white male dominated field working for NASA. Katie, the gifted girl with a mathematical mind, grew up to be Mrs. Katherine Johnson who was later pulled from the ranks of her fellow black female computer cohorts and placed in a polarizing environment of white males who were suffering greatly with insecurity, like the kind we often see displayed on Fox News Network. At any rate, she found herself challenged with the task of using geometry and other complex math to calculate the path for a US spacecraft to orbit Earth and land on the moon. Being the mathematical genius that she was, Catherine utilized every current and up-to-date mathematical method at the time and found herself at a numerical dead end without the numbers to move forward. Now, just over a little four years ago, we as a church gathered in the Mary Jane Ong gym to view the film Hidden Figures and other of us uh, saw the film when it was showed in theaters. Yet I think most of us missed a hidden message in the film, Hidden Figures. Katherine Johnson found herself like sisters Mary and Martha in a stinking, or as some would prefer to say, a stinking situation. In other words, Catherine, like Mary and Martha, she found herself in a dead situation. For Martha and Mary, their dead situation was that of their brother Lazarus who was for four days a dead man. And for Katherine Johnson, her dead situations was numbers and contemporary mathematical methods 
that had ran their course down to the last decimal point. A dead brother who lived no more. And what was modern math at that time that failed to complete the task of calculating how to land on the moon. Both, although different, were nonetheless dead situations. Church, have you ever found yourself in a dead situation? The biblical account of Lazarus represents more than just being faced with the dead, with the death of a loved one. But the account of Lazarus calls our attention to what it is like to be faced with dead situations, period. The unfortunate reality is that dead situations can surface in, any, in many ways and instances. When we talk of the variations of dead situations, we can find many things that are either dead, dying, or at a critical point of death. For some of us, our current state of health is in a dead situation. It's been ignored for far too long. For some of us, our relationships and even marriages are dead situations. The thrill is gone. For some of us, careers and or jobs are dead situations. Retiring is not a sin and trying something new may be just right for you. For some of us, our friendships are dead situations. It may be hard to say goodbye, but sometimes you have to throw up the deuces and say peace. For some of us, our finances are dead situations, constantly finding yourself robbing Peter just to pay Paul. For some of us, our grades or academics and even sportsmanship are dead situations. Doing just enough to get by can often be just enough to get left behind. For some of us, our social lives are dead situations. Remember, birds of a feather flock together and sometimes the flock is going nowhere. For some of us, our spiritual lives are dead situations, claiming Christ but failing to follow in Christ's example. And if we are to be honest, we can even collectively find ourselves in some dead situations. Just look at our nation still dealing with the aftermath of a divisive one-term president and the current national political climate and the societal conditions we have endured as a nation from domestic terrorism to shootings in schools, churches, mosques, synagogues, to continued acts of police brutality, ignored victims of sexual and domestic violence abuse, voter suppression, impoverished communities, and the intentional selling out of the public school education system. And the ongoing decline of the socially active and justice-minded Christian church. We can find ourselves faced with dead situations, both individually as well as collectively. So what does our text show us about such situations? For one, when Mary and Martha send word to Jesus that Lazarus' illness, about Lazarus' illness, Jesus responds by saying this, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Then he takes his precious time in going to see about them. Now, for us who may find ourselves faced with a dead situation or a dying situation, we must follow in the example of Martha and Mary in verse 3 by seeking out the Lord call his name, Jesus, send word, read the word, engage in conversation, prayer about our dead and dying situations. We must look to God for our guidance, strength, and help. Then we must realize that though God has heard our plea for help, God will ultimately help in God's own time. And oftentimes, God's timing doesn't always align with ours especially in our instant gratification seeking society and world. The text also shows us that the difference in God's timing and God's response to us requires a great deal of patience and can even leave us to a point of frustration. Imagine how Mary and Martha must have felt when their brother died and Jesus had made his way back to them to see about Lazarus and his condition. 
Many of us can relate to when God has failed to act within our dead situation and it gets to a point where it seems to be too late. So when God shows up at that point, that it appears that our patience has worn thin until the very end, we can find ourselves like Martha and Mary frustrated and upset saying, Lord, had you been here, my situation, and in their case, Lazarus, wouldn't have died. Yet even in their frustration and grief, we see they never stopped believing in the power and goodness of Jesus. When he called, they came. They responded, and most importantly, they believed. Today's text also shows us that even when we suffer, even to the point of tears. Our God does not leave us alone in that pain and experience, but our God endures with us. Jesus feels the sorrow with us, and just as he did with Mary and Martha, Jesus will even cry with us because we serve a God who is not removed from our pain and suffering, but our Lord knows our pain personally. Isn't it a blessing, church, to have a God who truly understands and sees us through our storms. Then in verse 40, Jesus reminds Martha by saying, did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? That's a reminder for us as we encounter our own individual and collective dead situations. We must remember that if we believe we are bound to bear witness to the glory of God in our situations, even those that are deemed dead situations. And then the text continues on and Jesus cries out with a loud voice for Lazarus to come out and Lazarus who was dead for a moment arises and Jesus commands them to unbind him and let him go. God in God's own time will call out our dead situations to arise with life just the same as he did with Lazarus for Martha and Mary. But like he told them, in order for us to see the glory of God in our dead situations, we first have to learn to unbind and let them go. We will never experience the revival of life if we keep clinging to our situations as if they're still dead. Some of us can't see God working within our dead situations because we're still dressing them in death's clothing and refusing to let the new life take form. Oftentimes, we do that because we come to realize that with God's revival of our once dead situations means that we have to engage, behave, and live differently ourselves. Sometimes our situations are revived but we drive them back to the point of death due to our failure to change. Let me say that again. Sometimes our situations are revived, but we drive them back to the point of death due to our failure to change. We look to God to change things and make things happen for us, but when it is our time to change, we want to keep on doing our thing. It doesn't work that way. And so it was with Katherine Johnson when she found herself in a dead situation, in a mathematical dead end. Perhaps the task would require the invention of some new math, she thought, but then God in God's own timing and in God's own subtle way fired the neurotransmitters of her brilliant mathematical mind. And she remembered an old method, Euler's method, which at the time was an archaic, outdated method. But in the midst of a dead situation, a once irrelevant, ancient, and even dead mathematical method was revived and given new life to do something that had never been done before. Talk about a hidden message within a hidden figure. Dead ends equal starting points. Starting points for resurrection, starting points for revival, starting points for renewal, starting points for redirection, starting points for restoration, starting points for revelation. Dead ends equal starting points. So when you find yourself at the point of a dead end situation facing a brick wall, don't give up on Jesus. 
Practice a bit of patience. You may find yourself frustrated, but be ready to respond when Jesus calls for your attention. Keep believing even in the midst of your dead situation, for in God's own timing, God's glory shall be revealed. Dead ends equal starting points. For one Friday night, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, came face to face with a dead end of his own. It wasn't a brick wall. It wasn't a road that led to water, but it was carried over his back, then placed upon a hill. It was made with wood. The dead end, my brothers and sisters, was none other than the cross. And we know indeed that our Lord lives beyond the cross. Christ lived beyond the cross that was raised on Calvary. Christ lives beyond the cross where he wore a crown of thorns. Christ lived beyond the cross where his hand and feet were nailed in place. Christ lives beyond the cross where his arms were stretched wide. Christ lives beyond the cross where it was pierced in his side. Christ lives beyond the cross where his mother and the two other Marys cried. Christ lives beyond the cross where he hung his head and died for Christ. The cross at Calvary was a dead end, but my God, the same cross was a starting point for God's glory was, be was revealed beyond the cross and Christ's resurrection. Dead ends equal starting points. Apply that to your life today. Whatever dead end situation you find yourself in, face it with the faith of knowing that dead ends equal starting points. God bless you and God keep you. Amen. The doors of the church are now open. You may come by letter, as a candidate for baptism, or simply by Christian experience. Perhaps you are faced with a dead end and you're looking for guidance to see beyond this dead moment. The door is open for you. Your dead end has a starting point. There is a new beginning to each end we meet. You may come now.
please know that the door is always open. We now will move to part of service in which we take up offering. Let's just make come. For those that are joining with us virtually, please know that we that you are able to give um, via a number of ways, either through PayPal or Givelify, or you can drop your gifts off in person or send them by mail. And the same applies for those that are present. You can give digitally as well. Let us pray. The Heavenly Father, we come knowing that you have given us much. Dear Lord, we ask that you bless what we have to give today, that you can multiply it to be sufficient for the work of your church. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. announcements that need your attention this morning. You'll note on the back of your program, we have our regular time for Sunday school and worship listed. Also note that we will have Bible study on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Our Bible study is done virtually on Zoom. And we also have two online links that you need to pay special attention to one is for the new ministry interest sign up. We need people to complete that. And we also need people to complete the ministry gifts assessment. 